Hey boys and girls, um, welcome back to Mineral Life. We're here in uh, beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, we're today, today we're gonna talk a lot about uh, recycling of batteries. Uh, and I mean, a different kind of recycling. It's not just grab a battery, throw it in an acid bath and hope that something is gonna come out. Today what we're gonna be talking about is the economics of these batteries and, uh, and how it's done and what, uh, uh, Kometco. <clears throat> I got it out and then choked to death. <laughs> and we're going to talk today about what Kometco is doing um, to uh, to enhance this new process. So today I'm with uh, I'm with uh, Norm Chow and uh, Jason Fenske, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask a few questions of Joe. Or sorry, Norm. Norm. <laughs> Man, I'm never going to get through this introduction. And today what we're going to do is we're going to ask Norm a few questions about, you know, what it is that, uh, what it is that they do here and how they do it. And uh, so uh, Jason and I are going to have fun uh, trying to stump you. It's stump the char. Uh, okay, stump sure. the star, yeah? Yeah, I'm like, great. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think just worth mentioning, we got a good number of questions from people on Twitter, and we're just yeah. going to read off some of those questions as well as ask our own. Sure, yeah. okay. Well, anyways, uh, um, welcome, welcome to Vancouver, welcome to Cometco. Uh, we, um, we're basically a contract research agency and uh, we did a, a development work for a company called Recyclico. And we did the, um, basically the process development, the patent development for a, a technology to recycle lithium ion batteries, um, just to convert the, the waste material back into the final product that goes into battery manufacturing in a closed loop, uh, closed loop manner. Well, what I'd like to start this off with is um, just the description of, uh, or the differential between black mass and black powder, because we're gonna be diving into uh, those two, uh, those two um, agents. Okay. So okay. That, that, that's probably a good place to start. Okay, okay. so, uh, so, so um, these are kind of new terminology because uh, the industry is relatively new, but uh, Black mass and black powder are um, um, feed material that comes from um, portions of the waste, waste battery. So black powder would be more like the, um, the uh, active material that, the, 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 the scrap material that never met the quality to go into a battery. So it's just, just uh, from the production scraps that have been ground down into a metal powder concentrate that we use for recycling. And, and that's the, yeah. the, the number that you, we really need yes. to know about that. It's like, it's around 30% you were saying, right? Uh, well, so, so black powder will have about 88% of the valuable active material. Um, so that would be the, if it's an NMC battery, for example, it'll have the nickel, manganese, cobalt, and lithium mm -hmm. oxides. And 12% generally would be like the aluminum, aluminum foil from the, uh, from the collector plate. No, I was talking about the... Um, the amount of scrap making the oh, okay, batteries. Sure. That's right. That's yeah. right. Okay. So, um, in the uh, the battery the battery chemistries for electric vehicles are generally they're they're basically a new technology. Um, it's not the same type of batteries that were in the conventional batteries that are in your notebook computers, your power tools. So these these new generation of batteries are a lot more difficult to make. Just to give you the high capacity and the high um, power, power densities and the safety and, the, and the, the cycle life. So they're very difficult to make. And as a result, currently there's a lot of production waste. So in the range of 30% ish in, in, um, is, is a, it, it ranges, but something about 30% is waste. And then with black mass, it's a slightly different... Uh... Black mass is a different uh, feedstock. So black mass is basically comes from the end of life battery that has the uh, casing material and basically it's just ground, it essentially it's ground up batteries that have been heat treated and where you produce a uniform, a uniform waste. It generally has less active materials because you're diluting it with the other parts of the battery. Mm. And this would be the black masses after they've scrapped out things like the aluminum or the steel or any of the other um, byproducts that would be mm, not really suitable for 
uh, for recycling. Yeah, there there is some uh, disassembly if that's what you're getting at, but yeah. they, they can't get it all. So like there's some some yeah. other Impurities, dilution yeah. uh, dilution that goes into black yeah. the black mass. But yeah. that, it basically the difference is production scraps producing black powder, which is a higher purity and higher metal content versus black mass, which is end of life batteries. So it's just ground up batteries that are so converted to a powder. Just to clarify here with the black powder, you're taking the positive electrode sheet. It's had the cathode applied to it. It's scrap. It's not useful for That's whatever right. reasons. And then you're taking that and that itself, uh, about 30% is wasted in that process. And then from that, about 12% of what you get, that black powder, is that aluminum sheet That's that right. that cathode is applied to? That's right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So why don't you kick it off, uh, Jason? You can. Oh, okay. Well, I would, I would kind of like just like a high level, what is Cometco's goal in this relationship and what is Recyclico's goal overall with this project? Okay. So uh, as a, Cometco is, is the... Uh, is the, the experts in um, technology development in the metallurgical industry. Um, Recyclico is our, is our customer where we develop the technology for. Okay. So, so the background goes back to Recyclico being previously American Manganese, which, which was a mining company. And uh, a while back, we worked on a mining, mining process for a low-grade manganese mine, and we developed um, a process to extract the manganese for steel production uh, in a you know economically uh, in more economic manner, um, and then the prices on the metals kind of went stagnant for a while. So what we did was many years later we came up with a like a light bulb moment and discovered that we can use the same technology we developed for the mining company to uh, recycle lithium ion batteries. This is a while back, this is before Model 3 came out. Uh, Model S first came out and that's our tip that electric vehicles were for real, like performance cars that did not drive like golf carts. They were just real performance cars. So we worked, embarked on a technology development um, to um, develop the technology so that we can convert the waste battery material and then process it hydrometallurgically to go all the way back into the final products that can go back into battery manufacturing, which is called precursor material and lithium products that go back into battery manufacturing. So we're working with Recyclical to commercialize this technology now. Okay, and so one thing that I, we, we were discussing earlier that I thought was interesting, today the actual feedstock for an operation like this the bulk of it actually comes from production waste rather than used old expired battery packs. And then that will change with time is the idea. That, that is correct. That is correct. Um, mm -hmm. there, there is a lot of production waste now because these new batteries are so complicated. Like the precursors are very complicated to make. They have multiple metals. They have a very uh, tight particle size. Um, just the specifications. They, they basically took the old technology and imp they worked out the kinks for EVs. So just the, the, um, to, to, the mixing different metals and uh, preventing, uh, avoiding like crushing and grinding operations or precipitating these particles to precise sizes um, and just making straight, going straight to the final product. So because they're so difficult to make and the specifications are so tight, there's a lot of production scraps. But with your process, the thing that I like the best is that your process takes it from either black mass or black powder and turns it into something that you can actually use as a, a, a cathode material, That's correct? Right. That's right. So everybody else says something else. They, they're, uh, they're taking the black mass, usually, and, uh, and they're taking that and turning it back into lithium or any of the other chemicals that can be pulled out, cobalt, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, and then you have to go and reformulate them. You have to remix them. And then you could use them as the materials that would be uh, wetted onto the, um, um, uh, on top of the copper. That's right. Right. So at the end of the day, 
you're saving a tremendous amount of um, uh, a, trend, a tremendous amount of work, processes and whatnot um, with your system versus everybody else. And that's what really caught my attention when I started reading about you guys. Sure. Uh, yeah, just that, that, that's a goal. I mean, we're kind of low key about it, but um, but uh, there, there's other ways of, uh, of recycling them, the, um, the batteries as well. I mean, the original way before um, this became such an important um, um, requirement for uh, sus sustainability uh, was to smelt the batteries. So they would just collect them, uh, collect the waste batteries, and you have to do basically put it into a furnace and do a thermal reduction into basically the metal product. So you would re recover the cobalt, the nickel, um, only 40% in the smelter. The lithium goes to the slag, the remaining metals goes, goes to the slag, uh, which is a waste product. Uh, and you also have to add a fuel to uh, do the reduction. So you have to add like carbon, like a carbon, carbonaceous fuel. Um, then, then uh, you know, some of the other companies go into what's called solvent extraction, which is more a conventional, like pretty much is, is a method of separating cobalt and nickel it's more of a conventional hydrometallurgical process, but it goes through many, many, many steps. Um, and uh, we decided just to bypass all those steps and go straight to the final product. Like with bypassing solvent extraction and just doing the extraction of the, um, the metals from the waste solids into the liquid form, doing a purification, and then making the precursors, which is done in these uh, special um, machines back here. These are the precursor I, reactors. Actually, we were talking a little bit about this. I, I've got two questions. Sure. I'd like to, or not questions, but comments. So these are um, about one twentieth of the size of the new factory that you're putting it to to Taiwan. Correct. That's correct. So if we look at this and you think about um, uh, going to your local brewery. If you look at those big cauldrons and whatnot, they would be the ones that would replace these uh, stainless steel cauldrons that you've got um, in back of us. And I thought that was brilliant, and I, I like the whole process. But the question that I was really going to ask, because you brought up CO2, um, what's the differential between what you do as far as CO2 emissions versus, um, say, your buddies in the... Um, um, basically burning process okay well uh that's a that's a good question i mean um so so basically we um provided our process flow sheet to a company called min barrel they're um they're kind of the main company that does the life cycle analysis and um they calculated about um 7.7 .7 kilograms of co2 per kilogram of precursor material that we make uh, the competitors are about 18.8. .8. .8. So bypassing the solvent extraction steps and going more direct um, drastically reduces the, the CO2 uh, requirements uh, for, for making the final products, which is, uh, and that's, that's compared to more of the uh, competitive type um, processing. When you compare it to virgin mining, it's significantly higher savings than that. Yeah, well, I've... Um, I mentioned before that I was at uh, different mining operations <clears throat> and if they're in remote areas, which is the case for most mines, uh, they're using a tremendous amount of diesel and that diesel, um, because they're out in the... But is it clean diesel? Uh, clean diesel, yeah. You'll have to talk to the Volkswagen people about that. I. I haven't really bumped into that. I am an engine engineer, <laughs> but not as smart as others. But anyways, when you look at these things, yeah. they're belching um, black smoke all yes. the time. Yeah. And these, these machines are gigantic, so yes. I can't even imagine. And then, what's the ratio for, um, like say, a ton, of, um, um, a ton of ore versus, what do you get out of that ton of ore if you happen to be looking at lithium, you, you or not a, lithium, but... Uh, you you but, have a... Uh, most of it's waste and you get a small amount of metal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like le less than 1% metal. Wowzers. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that kind of, this way here, you're, you're looking at recycling mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah, it's uh, a concentrated it's a huge, huge stock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, okay. Try I've got one. I like this question. Can you ask them how do they exist when the entirety of the internet says it's impossible? And so I think just to add to this, like, what are your big challenges in this industry for what you're trying to accomplish? Well, uh, I mean, when we, when we first got into this technology, uh, I had the, the exact same question, like, or same comments that, that it's impossible. But um, um, we, have, we have produced the precursors. We've sent them to all a, a significant number of battery manufacturers, um, chemical producers, auto, auto companies uh, worldwide and had them qualified. Uh, we also have, um, they've also made batteries and tested it and showed they perform just as good as virgin material. And in fact, we're following like known processes in the mining industry, which is assembling the, the unit operations in a more efficient manner. Um, and it's, it's, it's just like urban mining, basically. Like it's, it's either, it comes from waste battery, which is actually a higher purity than mine material, comes from one spot. So um, yeah, we, we've, we've shown that it actually works and we've, we've produced lithium products and precursors. Well, here's one that uh, kind of is adjunct to, to the last question. Beyond aspirations in positive language, What's the bad news about recycling? Can't think of any bad news, but well, uh, that's that's a good question. But you know, like um, uh, I think Tesla has shown that that uh, EVs are commercial. They basically develop a disruptive market that's that's changing the auto industry. Um, and um, you know, when these things, they, they're, it's it's growing at a at a pretty massive rate, and um, and if it were to continue to take over the market, you're not allowed to dispose of these batteries. It's it's it will be mandated that you must recycle, whether it's um, regulations because you can't dispose of these as hazardous waste. Um, the next thing is they're valuable. They're a valuable resource, uh, and the ec economics of of um, of the um, supply chain. Um, Mm. will mandate that we must recycle. So, you know, like I, when we first got into this, we had the same comments. It'll never be economic, but you can't throw these things away. So, so they must be recycled. And, yeah, and, and for EVs to be viable, um, this technology or, or technologies like this must exist. Mm. Mm. So what percentage of the batteries manufactured today will actually be recycled and the second half of this is um, what about in the next decade where do these end up if they're not if they aren't recycled that's, uh, that's and that's yes. you've kind of answered I, some I of this already that because you, you can't dump these so like yeah. if they can't if there's no technology to recycle they're going to end up in a big stockpile somewhere until someone has to deal with it yeah. uh, which is not it's like Sweeping something under the rug. Yeah, <laughs> delaying the problem. De oh. Delaying the problem. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, I would say you have to recycle 100%. Hmm. Yeah, otherwise you're stockpiling them somewhere, like an end-of-life battery. I think it's going to have to be some sort of government intervention because we already have um, something similar to this happening that's uh, a real problem, and that's um, old tires. Yep. What do you do with them? And if they if, and when they catch on fire in some warehouse or some place where people are hiding these things, turns into a gigantic. Um, um, you turn it into a coral reef, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah. You turn it into a coral. Brilliant. Yeah. The only thing that kills we're not coral. throwing it in the ocean. Yeah. We're creating yeah, a coral yeah, reef. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Perfect. You sound like you're from New York. Yes. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, it's a. Uh, it's your turn. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. So, Recyclico. Um, I, I wasn't aware of this before getting here. So it's like it's different in that we're not talking about taking something from a scrap battery or a, a salvage battery and then turning it into black mass. We're talking about the next step of creating something that a manufacturer, a battery manufacturer, wants to buy. Correct. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Um so that's that's the model as of today. I mean, you, you have to be a little bit flexible for evolution. But um, 
but, but right now recyclable is strictly a hydrometallurgical process. So we're taking either black mass or scrap and, uh, and, and converting it back to the ver like equivalent to the virgin material that goes back into making lithium ion batteries. So yes, we, we do the, the back end if that's the question. Okay. After, after you make the... Um, is that anticipated that it will remain that way or that it will eventually encompass the entire process? I think there's, there's, I think there's a chance you could include that one day, uh, depending on the, the, market, the market forces. Mm. But um, uh, in, in, the recyc in this recycling business, uh, one of the, the big, biggest business risks is actually the, the um, consistent supply of the feed. So um, if you're in the business, like if you, if you do a business model where you're sourcing on the open market, um, and the metal prices are going up and down, I think you r will run the risk of being caught one day where there's no feed or low feed or expensive feed or metal prices go low. And uh, you built, and, and if you go conventional, like for example, with solvent extraction, that's only economic. I mean, it's used heavily in the mining industry, but they have a consistent feed of large amounts of ore. But if you, you build these large solvent extraction plants, you need large to make it economic, but the solvent extraction plants are not conducive to very high turndown ratios. So it means if your feed quantity goes up and down, you basically can't run the plants. Mm. So, um, so our, our model is to kind of partner or joint venture with the source of supply, but also they're also the customer so that we, we kind of secure the supply and have the outlet for the final product. And uh, that's a more viable long-term methodology. But that, that, that's the best because, quite frankly, if you're co-located, yes. the logistics uh, problems you have, you have uh, the logistics, disappear. That's right. Yeah. You have the logistics. There's, there's several advantages. But, but the, the business model, I mean, we're technology developers, but the business model is, is like technology for business. Mm -hmm. You can have the greatest technology but the wrong business model, and you could be completely... So we kind of thought through all these aspects as well to come with uh, the efficient process and mm. kind of the correct business model for um, long-term long -term viability. So that would work well with the black powder and that's actually the more profitable uh, process, is it not? Uh, well, the black powder has greater metal value. Uh, now, uh, so- But so, more expensive to buy. That's right. So, mm. so uh, if you were to buy it, the black powder uh, the suppliers of the black powder will sell you the black powder on a percentage of the metal value. So, so these so are spot it, prices? Or? They're kind of spot prices, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah the spot prices. I would suggest that that is not a... It would be better if there was a long-term contract that right. uh, would go from year to year based on the yep. previous year's ups and downs. Yeah. Spot pricing you know, would... Uh, uh, that might be a real problem. Yeah, I think for, for the long-term viability, and, it, and it's actually best for the um, all, all partners involved because they will have yeah. their consistent um, supply of the feed. They'll mm -hmm. have a consistent supply of the final products. And then the viability of the recycler, recycle, recycle company is, is um, secured as well. Mm, excellent. Are there current regulations for what has to be done with a dead battery like say my car battery I mean, is I'm, toast it's not like you can throw a thousand pound battery in, that's right into so, your trash so, can so i don't think it's like that big of a fear that yeah. people do it on their own but yeah. are there rules surrounding it now i i don't know in in north america i don't know if there's any set rules on recycling batteries but there is you know the hazardous waste this waste disposal and transportation okay, okay, issues yeah. and from that alone prevents you from disposing of these batteries in a landfill mm. so um so that gets back to do they get stockpiled somewhere but yeah. but i mean as i mean the, the market's changed so much for evs and grown so fast in a short period of time that i don't think the regulations are just catching up okay and it's almost yeah. like the recycling you kind of have to look into the future and come up with everything you need to do to make this the most viable um technology to basically reduce or eliminate the combustion engine cars. Well, if you had to guess, um, 
What kind of regulations do you think that the government might crank out well, in order to... Well, they would, they would force the, either the auto manufacturers to ensure recycling of these batteries. Um, hmm. that, that could be a, the regulation. I mean, you're in the auto industry. Is like, is well, there, I, you know, yeah, yeah. mandated yeah. recycling. But I'm not in the uh, government industry. Okay. <laughs> I never you, know what those guys I. are. I thought maybe, uh, maybe you'd have the inside track or yeah. something. Yeah, I, like I know in certain countries, yes. Like uh, in, in Asia and, and Europe, there's some man, mandated uh, requirements on, on recycling. In North America, I don't think there is um, any, any official hmm. requirements on recycling yet. It's just everything's based on economics. And, and if you base it on economics, you and the regulation that you're not allowed to dispose of these, yeah. it leads to indirectly that you must recycle. Hmm. Cool. Uh, what is the efficiency rate of recycling? As in, if we have 100 units of battery, how many units can be made via recycling? Okay. Um, so if you, um, I guess that question is basically saying, um, so, so basically, if you have 100 units of, recyc uh, of batteries, uh, if you go through the theoretical chemistry of it, you could recycle 100%. That's the theoretical. Okay, so basically, we've done this from buying pure material feed into our laboratory studies. Now, if you look at the practicality now, because uh, the feed's no longer like something that I buy that's like a a pure virgin material, it's from a black mass or black powder. Um, we're getting extraction rates of 99%. And then there's some purification steps. You may lose some metals in the wash of the filter cakes for impurity removal. Uh, we're getting high 90s in the metal recovery. So lithium, manganese, cobalt, the 97 range, 97, 98% range. Mm. And the lithium recovery, we're getting about 95%. Okay. Yeah. And, so, and you lose a little bit in just the wa washing of the filter cakes and, and things like that. And what percentage of a battery is these materials? Are these materials? Okay. Uh, so what percentage? Okay. So, so like you're saying we, yeah. we can get, you know, 95 to 98%, whether it's lithium, yes. cobalt, manganese. Yes. Okay. Um, what percentage of a battery is made up of these elements? Okay. So, um, so basically in black powder, for example, which is from production scraps, you'll have 88% is the cathode material. And I'll give you an example of its NMC, which is the, one of the later generations of, uh, of, uh, of a cathode material. It's a lithium, so it's the chemical formula is Li, if it's N811, Ni, which is nickel, 0 0.8 moles, of nickel and 0 0.1 moles cobalt, 0 0.1 moles of manganese, and two oxygens. That's a cathode material. Um, so 88% of the weight in black powder would be that compound. And um, then you can, from a mole calculation, calculate how much nickel, it's about 40%. Lithium, just the lithium portion is about, about 4%. And then you have your your nickel and your manganese. And I think that's kind of the question. You can sell that aluminum as well. I mean, yeah, aluminum you can aluminum. sell as well. Yeah, we, basically um, the twelve percent. Yeah. So 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 depending on the process, we can recover the aluminum as aluminum foil, or sometimes oh, it's just really? sometimes it's ground up like a powder, and it just that portion just goes to a, a filter cake. It's, it's actually a waste product. Like it's, it becomes aluminum hydroxide if it's a powder form. So we okay. basically just dissolve it and we. We do a purification. Mm. Yeah, and that, there, there may be some metal loss in the aluminum, aluminum hydroxide. So where do you, who do you think is the leader um, on moving ahead using recycled materials in their battery packs? I don't, you know, honestly, it's so early stage um, that um, there's, there's high demand. People want to get the, the recycled materials, but it's, um, you basically have to commercialize all these plants to, um, to, hmm. to actually have real recycled materials into batteries these days. Yeah, because I'm wondering, I mean, we've got, I've, I've talked to um, or talked about different recycling facilities. Yes. And I know that they make black mass. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that somehow they 
they bring out the elements like lithium and manganese, and, or sorry, yeah, well, manganese, um, yeah. nickel, whatever. Yeah. But where, who is buying it? Does it go back to the spot crude market or, so or the so spot uh, market? Or? That's, a, that's a very good question. So, like, so the black mass would go into the smelting. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest market now. In, in Asia, they are doing hydrometallurgy, hydromet processing, um, single pass using certain, like uh, they're using peroxide as the um, reducing agent. I, I didn't, didn't give that lesson to you, but you actually need a reducing agent to dissolve these metals. So it's either hydrogen peroxide, we're using SO2. Um, peroxide has some things you have to be careful of because hydrogen peroxide um, is rocket well, fuel. It's rocket <laughs> fuel. So, and the next thing is it catalytically decomposes with oxides. So if you put an oxide in it, and you can look it up on YouTube since you're YouTubers, uh, it, the, the peroxide would decompose spontaneously with a, with a metal oxide. Now, to prevent that, you can have dilute peroxide, like 30%. But the problem there is you have a huge amount of water with a peroxide and the whole water balance goes off. So you might go single pass with a huge amount of wastewater or you have to treat the water using expensive methods. So in our process, we're using more like SO2, which is used in mining, food production, yeah. in liquid form. And, or gaseous form, concentrated, so that we can run a closed loop process. Yeah. And um, that's, uh, that's sulfuric kind of another gas part of the difference of yeah. our technology. Yeah, for the folks that aren't chemists, SO2 yes. is sulf sulfuric a uh, acid. It's sulfurous acid, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's a reducing agent because these metal oxides are, they're called higher valent oxides, so they're quite insoluble in typical sulfuric acid. Mm. So you have to add the SO2 or the peroxide to dissolve them. Mm. There's numerous chemistries, uh, and that's always changing. How challenging is it to adapt to that? Uh, well, the, the chemistries are changing. There's numerous chemistries, but they're very similar. So there's uh, nickel, cobalt, manganese oxides. What they're, what they're really changing is the ratios of the different metals. So for example, like if you look on just a capacity basis, like the nickel would be the highest highest capacity, but the nickel is unstable. So it reacts, you know, in, in air, it absorb moisture, CO2, it's just very difficult to handle. The next thing is, it's, it's put in a lithium ion battery, it's, it's put in conditions where if you were to cycle it, the structure is not, not stable either. So they have to add the cobalt to stabilize the structure. And then they add the manganese or aluminum, which is an NCA, to stabilize the environmental stability of it, so it's easier, easier to handle. Um, so they are changing, but they're relatively the same. Mm. It's like a lithium with a base metal. Um, the base metal form, forms an oxide that has the skeleton that holds the lithium. So when you uh, charge a battery, the lithium leaves the skeleton and goes into graphite. And when you discharge, the lithium shuttles back. It's called intercalation. And that's the basis of how a lithium ion battery works. But they're different, they're different particle sizes. The chemistry is approximately the same. Well, one of the things that we talked about was um, <clears throat> how valuable, or let me rephrase that, how scarce some of the materials are. One of them that's scarce that people don't really talk too much about is uh, graphite. Um, natural graphite, uh, right now, it only comes from China. And I asked the question a bit ago about, well, can we recycle the graphite? And uh, you gave me an answer. Yeah, well, well like um, after, after, so far in a, in a lithium ion battery, like um, uh, can you, the question is, can you do it economically? Because, yeah. because in a lithium ion battery, the graphite structure after, after utilization, it doesn't go back to its original form. So, so, I mean, you could recycle it. The, the, the question is economics because you have to purify the graphite, meaning you have to leach out metals. When I say leaching, you have to dissolve the metals in the graphite and you have to convert the structure back to the original structure, which uh, generally entails very, very high temperatures. So it's not to say that it's impossible, but the question is the economics at this stage. So, so a lot of this, the, the carbon, um, 
products, byproducts that come out of this recycling process goes into um, uh, maybe more, more util lower value util utilization. Mm -hmm. For example, fuel for steel making or yeah. So like does that. this graphite naturally have that advantageous structure, or why, wh why once you have it, uh, you know, destroyed from the process of trying to recycle it, is it less valuable than finding that same material? It, it just you know, if you were to, to mine virgin graphite, or versus the cost of recycling at this at this stage, okay, um, that that's where, where the. <clears throat> The so difference is, comes into play. It's kind of like the Humpty Dumpty deal, yeah. right? No, yeah. nobody's going to put this back together again. Yeah. And uh, I think someone will solve that, though. Like it's just, you know, right now, if you look, if you break down the economics of a, of a lithium ion battery, most of the value is in the, the base metal and the lithium. And, um, and people are working in this field. And that, that could likely be solved one day is the recycling of the graphite. Hmm. Yeah, just there's probably a, there's quite a bit of research in that field as well. I'm just saying as of today, uh, this is the current status. Well, we um, we've had a lot of discussions today. Actually, <laughs> we spent uh, hours uh, solving all the world's problems. And it's obvious that you guys know quite a bit about mining and refining and sure. what's available out there to get the jobs done. And one of the things that I'm extremely interested in is um, is lithium mining and you gave us uh, sure. a, several different examples of where and how we can make things happen yes. so okay. maybe you could go through some of that i mean, I mean uh cur currently um uh half about half the world's production of lithium this, this is an approximation comes from like one mine in australia it's basically what's called a spot mine it's a it's a hard rock mine and uh, there's a um approximately like a six six percent they concentrate to like a six percent um lithium um product mm. and then then it goes into processing they, they ship it all to china and a lot of it's processed in china so they mine it in australia they'll, they'll ship it to china and they'll extract the lithium in, in spot i mean there's a certain methodology of extracting the lithium to make uh lithium products um that lithium mineral is insoluble in sulfuric acid as well so what they have to do is they have to take the mineral, they do what's called an acid bake. So they add concentrated sulfuric acid into a furnace and they bake it at a few hundred degrees and it converts the um, beta, uh, alpha, uh, beta spotamine, alpha spotamine, does it does a conversion to make it soluble. And then they um, basically do a, a water leach of the, um, of the, uh, of the converted material. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they get a, a lithium solution um, that they purify. It's called a lithium brine of a certain concentration, and then they just precipitate it as uh, lithium carbonate. So just out of curiosity, why do the Australians not just sell lithium instead of sending it to China? Uh, I can tell you, the Chinese uh, invested in the mines. <laughs> oh, they bought the mines. Oh, well, there you go. But, Who'd have thunk it? No, yeah. certainly nobody here yeah. in the U.S. would come up yeah. with something as crazy as that. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. But, uh, but and then it, you can control yeah. the market. Oh my God, that'll never happen. Yeah. We'd probably have people going to jail. <laughs> Thank God, you know. Oh, whoa, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. But uh, but the other the other half of the lithium comes from um, brines. Yeah. So it's, uh, so mainly South American brines, which is a natural natural groundwater that is is rich in lithium. Um, and uh, it has a certain uh, chemistry to it to allow it to be uh, extracted economically. Actually, it's the lowest cost production is from the solar brines because you're relying on uh, solar power, natu natural sunlight to do the evaporation to concentrate the lithium. Um, but you can tell from the you can tell from the chemistry of the brine whether it's going to be economic extraction or not, mm -hmm. based on the impurities in the brine. So things like calcium and magnesium would consume lime, which is the biggest cost item, to purify the lithium solutions. So that's the other half of the production. But there they are limited to expandability because there's only so many solar ponds, so many brines. Um, as these EVs become more um, uh, a higher percentage of the market, there's other lithium deposits 
around the world. For example, in Canada, the United States, there's a very large uh, uh, lithium deposit in Nevada, the Ionia Rhyolite Ridge. That, that one can supply a significant amount of lithium and boron as a byproduct. That would be a very, because of the byproduct, it would be a very economic um, proposition as well. And then there's various clays, which are different, requires different technology, different processing. It's not spodamine, it's not brine. Uh, in a clay, you have to, when, when you do, when you add acid to extract a lithium, you have to be able to filter. So the, 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 that's where the more challenges, although some deposits are different from others, to, to be able to filter the lithium solution from, from the clays after you've done the extraction mm -hmm. is some of the challenges that, you know, just can be overcome with higher prices or demand. Well, actually, one of the things that we also talked about a little bit was the availability of these different um, elements. And um, I mentioned uh, the find, actually, it's Exxon that, that, uh, that uh, found this, uh, um, I, I keep wanting to call it an aquifer, but I can't, I don't think that's the right term. But anyways, a great big gigantic um, pond, if you like, below the surface of the earth, that's loaded with these um, these uh, brine. Yes. Uh, so taking, and I, and I know there's a bunch of people, I know that Exxon is doing this, Energy X is doing this. Um, could it be that somehow we could uh, catch up without having to uh, buy from from China? Yes, you can, you can definitely develop your own resources in in other parts of the world, North, even North America, United States, Canada, there, there's lots of, um, there's actually lots of resources and uh, there's a lot of projects in, uh, in the um, development stages. Mm -hmm. like it's just, they're anticipating the great demand for, uh, for these required materials. So let me ask you, is, um, <laughs> Has anybody ever coordinated this? I mean, I, I definitely don't want the government to get involved, but has industry in, in general thought about coordinating the, the natural resources needed for, um, you know, getting us, uh, getting us through this uh, bump in the road, as it were? Honestly, they're not coordinating. They're relying on economics. So, like, um, mm. a, as demand goes up, the prices go up. They have, they develop their own, pro their own projects and they, they generally compete with each other. So uh, it's, not, it's not like a coordinated effort, it's just based on free market conditions that, um, that will make, the, and, and demand uh, that would make uh, the development of these things viable. Well, if we had to depend on that, we'd never ever build a bridge, ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I, honestly, I think it's happening. I think, I think, I think the demand is so, it's, it's, it's happening so fast and uh, these, e these EVs are, are really increasing in a massive rate um, that, that it's going to force governments to, they're, they're investing in these projects. Now they have to kind of coordinate with each other to get these permits out faster. Mm -hmm. so, so the government are already investing in the projects. They're investing in battery plants. They're investing in, in mining projects. Um, and then they just have to coordinate it with themselves to get the permits to go through. Mm. And then there's all, the whole economic factor of developing the process as well. So Jason, have you got anything else on your, on your uh, list of uh, questions? Not much, no. I, okay. I did have one clarifying question if we can go back to when you're mentioning the aluminum from black powder. Yes. What determines whether or not that aluminum is or is not recycled okay um okay so um okay so there's scraps which is actually the foil yes with the um active material coated onto it yes that sometimes for convenience is converted to black powder like just for handling purposes so all of it ground up together that's right okay. that's right uh we have worked on in part of our technology it's actually part of the patent as well we have a pre-treatment step if it's in foil form to separate the active material from the foil. Okay, so that you can save the That's foil. That's right, it goes through a screening process and uh, we actually have metallic foil 
that we can compress and sell as a puck to a aluminum recycler. And then we take the um, active material and go through our hydromet process. Now, okay. sometimes the feed is already ground up, okay. in which case you have to dissolve the whole thing. Right. And then you have to precipitate the aluminum separately and it becomes a filter cake, basically. So it basically depends on how processed it is before it gets right. to you. That's right. Okay. That's right. Well, I got a couple of questions here, but they're not quite um, uh, related. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just read the one off here. Sandy's experience in Asia, the public markets, EV OEMs, um, the differing rates of EV adoption in various markets, etc. Sandy's experience, um, okay. I'd rather turn that into your experience. <laughs> so what do you think, uh, what do you think about um, the, uh, the way things are heading? Bearing in mind that almost every car company uh, in Europe and in, uh, in North America has uh, peed their pants and run toward getting back into what they really know, which is ICE vehicles. So what, what yeah. are your okay. well, thoughts? I mean that, that's a very good question. I mean, do I have a, a long answer in that? So, so basically, I mean, I'm, I might go off a little bit off topic here, but there's a, a book from a Harvard, Harvard professor is called um, The Innovator's Dilemma. I don't know if you've oh, heard of yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I've got, okay. yeah, I'm sitting on my... So, like, yeah. um, will the, the traditional automakers who get scared over the next quarter or are worried about the fraction of percent margin yeah. and make all their decisions based on that, will they just, you know, slightly improve their cars? Or will, you know, an innovator come by, for example, a Tesla, um, that's more nimble, uh, maybe started off very niche, like the Roadster, and took, developed the technology and developed what's called disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. um, Will, they, will there be an existential threat? So, and then, and who's gonna decide that is in the future, it's gonna be consumers based on the performance of the cars, the economics, um, and you know, uh, convenience. As you mentioned, you own these, you, you have no problem with, um, with range. Um, there's, there's technology built in to find you the chargers, tell you how to drive, there's self-driving. In some cars. In, in some, some in some cars, Not yeah, all. yeah, in some cars, but there there definitely is an existential threat somewhere that's gonna. <laughs> I think it's him, but anyway, <laughs> there's gonna be a threat that's gonna yeah. potentially convert a combustion engine car into a VCR or steal a huge amount of the market. So, you know that that's the answer on that. I think I think if you look into the future. If you don't do some form of electrification, whether it's full electric or plug-in hybrid or something, you run the risk of an existential threat that you might become blockbuster video or something like that. <laughs> well, I, uh, I was interviewed by somebody. Yeah. Um, I get interviewed a lot yeah. lately. Um, mostly people want to point at me and say, oh, you said by 2030, 50% of the vehicles that were manufactured would be EVs and I said, well, EVs are hybrid. You said hybrid. that earlier today? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did say it earlier <laughs> well, today. I, I was but a bit more careful. I, I said a range. I said between 30 and 80. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> Somewhere yeah, between well, zero and 100. Video, friend. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, this guy, he brought that up. And, um, and I said, no, it's EVs and, and plug-in hybrids. And he said, well, obviously, everybody's going in the direction of plug-in hybrids. So they must know more than you or something along those lines. And I said... Mark my words, um, plug-in hybrids will be the pet rocks of the future. <laughs> and uh, there was a long s silence, and he said, where, where do you get off like that or something? And I, and I said, uh, um, I'm not 100% right all the time, but I'm never 100% wrong. That's okay, a, this interview is over. That's, a, that's, <laughs> actually, that's actually a pretty good answer, actually. Yeah. Like, um, like it's, it's hard to precisely predict the future. But one thing for sure is these EVs have been pr proven to f perform just as good or better than your combustion engine car. Um, and and um, 
and you can get I can get to work reg on a regular basis. Um, yeah, so so that alone, and and I don't have to rely on fuel is quite expensive. Mm. Um, they're they're cheap to operate. They're cheap to maintain. They have less parts. Um, the prices for batteries are coming down. Uh, there's there is a lot, and and there's a lot of improvement to come. But I think the net improvements on EVs versus combustion engine cars is there's going to be a huge difference in oh. terms of improvement. As an engine engineer and a powertrain kind of guy, I can tell you we can It's not possible to squeeze much more out of a, an internal combustion engine unless we change the, the combustion format. So if you go to hydrogen, okay, that's a possibility, but instead of 14 to one or gasoline and air, um, now I'm gonna try and get to 100 to one, and I'm not gonna get the output because I just can't pump that much in to make that conversion. I have to go to something else like a turbine or something. Yeah. And I don't think people are gonna be really thrilled when they see the prices of those. That That's an expensive, uh, Sure. piece of equipment so I don't see this having uh, long legs as it were yes yeah, I think to, yeah I think that sooner or later we're going to be uh, all driving an electric yeah it's, and it's even hard to say if, if the newer engines are actually an improvement because I've owned a lot of car uh, my, my older car actually is more reliable than the, all the new ones I've had uh, just from all the stuff they put in it there's a few less systems <laughs> on the older there's, car uh, yeah Basically, the engine is uh, more electronics than yeah. and software than it is, you know, yeah. uh, internal combustion, as it were. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a misnomer. Any other uh, tidbits you want to tell us? No, I really okay. appreciate this. It's well, been yeah. great. I mean, yeah. yeah, it was. It's, it's it was nice fabulous. to have a YouTube interview here. I mean, I uh, appreciate you guys coming to Vancouver and hope you enjoyed your trip here. Oh, for we sure. did. Absolutely. Yeah. It's wonderful. Anyway, thanks very much, guys. And uh, thank you all for watching Monroe Live. Keeps, uh, keeps, keep tuning in our channel, if I can spit that out. I got so excited, I can't even remember how to shut, the, shut this thing off. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways, we had a good time here. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jason. And thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Jason.